Rasmussen, your host. It's a privilege and an honor to bring this broadcast to you. You know, God is exciting. God is exciting. The things of God are exciting, and we want to share with you some of the excitement that God has given us. It's hard to contain the excitement there is to be found in this one called Jesus Christ. We have an exciting testimony coming up in the next several minutes. You are going to enjoy hearing how God has worked in the life of a very uh, special individual, fellow brother in the Christ, in Christ, and we're, we're going to be uh, hoping that uh, God will have his wife also come and share so that you'll get to hear a little bit about what she would have to share. You know, there's a lot of hurting people. There's a lot of struggling people. There's people right now watching this broadcast who are hurting. You're hurting. You're struggling with life having difficulties with situations that you're not able to deal with. Our purpose is to somehow, some way, be used of God to reach out, help you get something from God that you have not been able to get up until this moment. That's our heart's desire, to impart something from God to you that will help you. Maybe you don't even believe there's a God. Maybe you're not sure God is real. Many of us were like that at one time. If that's where you are, perhaps in the next several moments, as you watch this video, as you watch this broadcast, something will happen that you can say, yeah, yeah. God is real in that guy's life. God is real in that guy's life. I want God to be as real in my life as it is in that brother's life. Or maybe something that's going to get said will be the very thing that you need to hear. Our heart's desire is to bring something from God to you. And so with that, I just want to share uh, uh, just a couple of scriptures that come to mind here before we move into the testimony time. Um, in the New Testament, in uh, the book of Luke, chapter 15, one of the most exciting and insightful scriptures that could ever be recorded in God's Word is given here. It's something that we take very lightly in today's society. We all have beliefs about God in one form or another. Um, here in chapter uh, 15 in the book of Luke, verse 7, it reads, Jesus is talking here. Jesus Christ is the one talking. And he says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And that can be translated down to uh, saying that those of us who don't see ourselves as sinners, why would we, we, we want to repent of something that we don't believe that we're guilty of? So a teaching needs to be made on that, and perhaps God would lead us to expand on what Jesus is saying in uh, its totality there at the, at the end of this broadcast. But, but just for the sake of just prodding um, your understanding a little bit of how, how Jesus Christ thought about sinners and how he thinks about sinners, how God views this issue of sin, reading on down there uh, to verse 10, Jesus continues, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God. There's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Notice it doesn't say there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over someone who wins the million dollar lottery or who has... Um, 
accomplished anything in this life that we would consider uh, something noteworthy of an accomplishment. The emphasis here is that God's angels get highly excited when one human being sees himself as God sees us and then grabs a hold of what God has given humanity to deal with the sin issue. Forgive me for sh taking too long. Uh, I just wanted to uh, share a little bit about that because we may end up uh, sharing some things at the end of this broadcast that would dovetail into that. Why would angels get excited when one soul gets saved? Well, you're going to get that answer, I believe. You're going to get part of that answer as this brother comes and his wife comes as God would release her to do so and impart to you some things from the Holy Spirit. Brother Barry, I'd like for you to come up. Um, got us both in there. Uh, director, camera director, this is Barry Pierce. Amen. This is my brother in the Lord. His wife, Bridget, stands with him in their marriage. Hopefully, she'll be coming up. But Brother Barry, you've not always been excited about God, have you? No, not at all. Um, really felt that uh, I didn't really think I'd get to know Christ until I was up in my latter years my older years and uh, it's just a blessing to know that uh, God always has a plan for our lives and uh, but we don't always know that at first you know we see God working in other people's lives and you, know, you always figure them to be great men and women of integrity and and uh, you know I just never felt that it would be me <laughs> so well, brother, I would ask you to take us back and take us back into your childhood and give us some understanding of where you came from and what life was like for you and then share how, how God began to work in your life and how you responded to him and, and mention any of the positive changes that you can remember that's, that uh, has come about in your life. and. And impart to us, you know, if you feel led of the Lord to do so, impart to us about God has got a plan for us. God's got a destiny. Yeah. Amen. That's important. Yeah. There's a lot of people out there that don't know that God has a plan for each and every person yeah. that was born on this planet. Yeah. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. Yeah. And not everybody's going to walk into that plan or purpose unless yeah. they give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And that is so true. Hey, brother, so I'm true. robbing your thunder. Right. Share with us. Amen. 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 Well, first of all, I'd like to start out by saying it's a blessing to be able to be here to share how God has worked and been very active in my life. And uh, I'm very blessed to be able to stand here and say that because there have been so many that uh, that can't say that. And I thank God for his grace. Um, I come from a family of uh, seven children. Uh, I'm the eldest of the seven. Um, I am the only male that is still living. I had two brothers that passed away, one as a very small infant and the other one passed away at the age of 15. Um, I have five sisters. Um, I grew up in a family that really didn't have a strong religious background. Um, we knew of God, we knew of Jesus. Um, we went to church, but however, the principles of God were never really practiced in our presence. Um, I never thought that I would be saved um, at such a young age. Um, I really felt that I would be, 
you know, 65, maybe 70, 80 years old, find out that I have some type of terminal disease. And, and upon that, I would cry out to God, accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Then I would die and <laughs> go on to heaven. But it's obvious that God had another plan for me. And it really began, as I look back on it, it the plan really began to come into focus when I was in my senior year in high school. Um, that's when all your counselors and your teachers are trying to tell you, look, you have to get serious about your life. You know, you're going to go to college. Now is when you need to find out what you're going to be. What are you going to do when you grow up? Well, naturally, you know, people want to see you as a doctor, a lawyer, perhaps a politician. But as I said in front of my counselor, he says, Barry, what do you want to do? For the rest of your life, how do you want to make a living? Well, as I sat there in front of the counselor, the first thought that came to my mind was that I wanted to be called to preach and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I never really went to church, wasn't made to go to church. But yet and still, that was the number one thought that came across my mind because I thought there was no better job than to be called by God and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well. That was the thought, but that's not what I spoke out of my mouth. What I told my counselor is that I wanted to be a psychologist. And so here I am graduating from high school, and I do a year and a half of community college and just got nowhere. Was really bogged down, wasn't happy. It was really a struggle for me. Things in my personal life really weren't going as I would desire. And my mother at that time was going through a very tragic divorce. I watched my mother suffer financially. I watched her suffer spousal abuse. And I'm saying to myself, what can I do to help? And so consequently, I dropped out of college and enlisted into the Army. And that was a lot of fun because I learned a lot about myself. I got a chance to travel, to meet a lot of different people. And at that time, still I had not made a commitment to God. I hadn't turned to God for really nothing. When I went into the service, I just strictly depended upon my own ability to perform. I knew that I wasn't dumb, I wasn't stupid. I was tall, I was dark. I even considered myself as being handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so consequently, I just simply believed in myself and my own ability. But as I look back over the time I spent in the service, I began to realize now that how God was directing and had his hand upon me. And I went into the service and I left home drinking par primarily milk and I went from milk to drinking beer. And as I got to Germany, it was beer, wine, alcohol. It was readily available. So at times, I felt like I was a tourist in Germany, like I was on a long vacation. But as I look back at it, I began to see that God allowed me to experience a lot of different things. And most of these things that I experienced were not good for me. I remember one time in particular, we had been out on a reforger, which is nothing more than a NATO war game, and you just travel all over. You go through a lot of different towns and different cities, and, 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 and all the, the German public would come out, and they'd be cheering as we went through. And it, it, it was really a lot of fun. But in all of that fun, came along with that was the alcohol. And I can truly say that I became a very heavy drinker. And when you're in the service around a bunch of men like that, they take pride in being able to drink and being able to, to still function under the influence of alcohol. And so I perfected that. And so this one particular night after we had played this NATO war game, this reforger, we're convoying back to our base, and, and my driver and I decided that, well, 
we're going to kind of get away from everybody else. We're going to go to this little guest house and we're going to get something to drink. And so we found a little guest house not too far away and, and we sat down and we began to drink this particular alcohol by the name of Jägermeister. And we drank a whole fifth of Jägermeister. And in that fifth of Jägermeister, there was exactly 42 shots. We drank 21 shots a piece of Jägermeister. And needless to say, when we stood up and got ready to leave, we were toasted. We were blasted. As you can see, I wore glasses and I was so intoxicated that I had to take these glasses off to see better. Now, and I realize that doesn't make any sense, but the fact of the matter is, that's how intoxicated we were. I had a driver, but that night I said to myself, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die at my own hands at the wheel. And so I drove back to where we had set up bivouac for that particular night. But in the process of driving back, here we are driving a one-quarter ton Jeep. And here I am, I'm snatching it in first gear and I'm snatching it in the second gear. But as I began to drive, I began to nod at the wheel. And I woke myself up only because I had hit a guardrail. And I said, oh man, a guardrail. Whew, got it. And I pulled the Jeep off the guardrail and I kind of focused a little bit as best I could. And I began to nod again and I hit the guardrail again. And I snatched the Jeep back off the guardrail. But this time, as I began to focus, and here it is, pitch black at night. But as I began to focus, I began to see this bright light that was out in front of me. And as I began to see and as I began to focus, I began to realize that there was an angel of God there that was literally flying backwards, directing me. And when I got to my turnoff, to where I could go back to where we were bivouacked, then the angel disappeared, and I made it down this little two-track road and stopped. And needless to say, when I woke up the next morning, I was extremely sick. My driver woke up. Here I am with a hangover. My head is pounding back and forth. And all my driver could say is, Pierce, we did it. We drank a whole 50 Jägermeister. 21 shots apiece. I'm like, yeah, we did. And believe me, we felt it the next day. But I, as I began to reflect back on the events of the night, I began to realize, man, <laughs> I was lucky to be alive. He was lucky to be alive. He was passed out. There was no way that he would have realized what had happened if we'd have went over that guardrail. And so at that point, I began to realize that God was with me. Now, I'm not saying that I changed my life because after that, I did. I just went on doing my own thing. But the fact of the matter is, I realized that God was active in my life. And so I did the three years in the service. I came home and I continued in the same lifestyle. I came home, I got with my friends. The first thing we did is we went out, we got some beer. I took the beer, took the cap off, I turned the beer up and I had to spit it out. And I looked at my friend and I said, man, how can y'all drink this stuff? <laughs> and they kind of looked at me like it was something wrong with me. You know, and the fact of the matter is, if you've ever been to Germany, if you ever drink German beer, you realize that it's strong, it's very potent. And to drink an American beer, it literally felt like it was water in my mouth. But needless to say, I adopted to it. <laughs> and so what happened was that I simply began to drink, bought a fast car, began to chase a lot of women. That was my lifestyle. Yep, I got a job, almost lost it. Matter of fact, they ain't going to fire me until I talked them out of it. So I was always one that depended on myself. I got a job. Eventually, I got married. I set some goals in my life, and I began to accomplish these goals. And as I did that, I began to look around and say, man, I'd have made it. 
two cars, new home, full of furniture, getting promoted on my job. My son is born. I looked around and I'm like, man, I done made it, the American dream. I done accomplished it. But as I began to get lifted up in pride, and at the time, I didn't realize what it was. But as I began to get lifted up in pride, my wife, who had been saved most of her life, began to tell me, if you don't stop, if you don't slow down, God is going to bring you down. And I just began to look at her, and I'm like, woman, what are you talking about? God is going to bring me down. How are you going to bring me down? You know. And I'd go out and I'd do my own thing. I'd get with my buddies. we go out. You know, we go to after hour joints, go to the club, party, ride out in the park, sit around, drink. I had no problems. Had money in the bank. Come and go when I got ready. Took care of home. I had no problems. But every now and then, my wife would say, If you don't watch out, God is going to bring you down. So there would be some times when I would listen. I would hear what she would say. I'd go into the other room and I'd sit down for about 30 seconds. Man, hmm. I'd get back up and say, well, if it happened, it happened. And I'd go on again. So I guess one point that I want to make is this. Is that for those of you men that are married whether you're in the Lord or out of the Lord. When your wife begins to tell you things, you better take heed. You better listen. Because as surely as my wife warned me about God bringing me down, that he surely did. And it's really interesting because 1 Peter 5 and 8 talks about the devil. Talks about how he walks about as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And I understand what that is now because the Bible describes him as a roaring lion, but yet and still we know that he's not a lion. But the fact of the matter is that's indicative of the strength and power that he has. And as I think about that and look back over my life, I began to realize that when I was drinking, when I was partying, when I was doing things outside of the will of God and on my own and depending upon my own self, all the enemy was doing is just simply setting me up. And if you know anything about a lion, a lion preys upon the weak. Them that are young, them, them that are firstborn, and they stalk. And then without a warning sign, they pounce upon you. But it's interesting because as a lion stalks about his prey, God, on the other hand, will continue to alarm and alert them that he care about. And in the voice of my wife, I fail to heed the warning. And so consequently, I failed. But it wasn't only me that failed. It was them that loved me and around me. They fell also. Because the head of the household, when I fail, everybody fails. And consequently, here's a man that was working every day, had two cars, had money in the bank, riding around in Cadillacs. As far as I was concerned, I had it going on. Until that time happened when I began to look around and I'm like, man, working every day and one bill collector calling on the phone, the other one knocking at the door. Mr. Pierce, uh, when are you going to make this payment? Uh, I'm going to make that payment on uh, uh, the 15th of the month. The 15th of the month would roll around and I wouldn't have his money. On the 16th, he'd be calling. Mr. Pierce, where's my money at? I hang up on the phone with him and I go to the door and there was another bill collector knocking on the door. Now I'm working every day. I got a good job. But yet and still, there was never enough money to meet my needs. Why? Because I failed 
to heed the warnings of my wife. I had an aunt tell me, Barry, if you don't go to church, God ain't going to bless you. I understood that. I knew that I needed God in my life. I knew that I needed Jesus Christ in my life. I knew that. But my attitude was that heaven can wait. I'm too young right now. I ain't ready to quit drinking. I'm not ready to quit partying. I'm not ready to quit going to the club. I don't want to give those things up. Therefore, Jesus can wait. And so God literally allowed the devil to devour practically everything in my life. And I had to hold on like never before because my wife even wanted to leave me. And let me tell you, when the ship starts sinking, you ain't got no friends, I'm telling you. They ain't going to come around and say, well, how, how, how can we help you? Here, here's an extra thousand dollars, man. Don't, don't worry about it. Now, when you start going down, you're going down by yourself. And I went down the drain. It's like having a bathtub stopped up with water, and you pull the plug out of it, and the drain is clean, and it just... And when I got to the bottom, it went... Boom, 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 boom. It was over with. It was over with. Everything that I had accomplished in life, I just about lost. All of it. Because of drinking, smoking from time to time, partying, chasing women, doing all these things, depending upon myself. But God had another plan, and I thank him for that. Because I went through two years to where I didn't like myself. Because when I began to look at my life, I began to realize that, man, I was a jerk. I began to realize that, man, this ain't it. Even though I had caused all these things to happen, I kept telling myself, you're a better person than that. I didn't like myself. I didn't like what I had become. I certainly didn't like the way I had ended up. And I began to wallow in self-pity. I began to tell myself that, well, you can't do it. You can't make it. I had no confidence in myself. I couldn't even go out and water the grass. I literally did nothing. But while at work, it was an old man that came and told me. He says, Barry, he said, God has got something that he wants you to do. He says, I don't know what it is, but God has got something that he wants you to do. And then he looked at me. He says, Barry, do you believe that? And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, Romaldo, I, I do believe that. Because I just got through praying. And here's a man that never prayed. Never asked God for anything. And the man handed me a track on salvation. And I looked at it. I skimmed over it. Stuck it in my pocket. Came home from work. My wife looked at it. She said, hmm, what you doing with this? I said, well, the man at work gave it to me. But I took it and I laid it down. Didn't accept Christ as my personal savior. So little by little, I began to put the pieces of Barry back together as best I knew how. I literally had to start doing the things that would allow me to feel good about myself again. I had to get up. I had to water the grass. I had to get up. I had to learn how to wash the dishes. I had to start doing things around the house that would help me begin to like myself again. And as I began to pick myself up and begin to look around, and as I began to stretch out, you know, and begin to feel good about myself again, I'm saying, okay, now I'm coming back. But while I was putting myself back together, God was allowing men whom he had called, who loved him, who lived a Christian life, 
these type of men begin to come across my path. And one day at work, it was this Christian man, he came up to me. He says, Barry, he said, how you doing? Well, naturally, I ain't going to tell him I ain't doing all that great. I tell him I'm doing fine. <laughs> Father, I'm concerned. You know, I didn't begin to put the pieces back together. You know, I'm going to be all right. He looked at me. He says, brother, he says, I love you. And I'm looking at him. I'm like, yeah, right. You know, here's this white guy. I'm a black man. This man is telling me that he loves me. I kind of looked at him, and I kind of looked at him as he walked away. I'm saying to myself, okay, well, what kind of new plan is the Klan got now? <laughs> Y'all might laugh, but I was serious. I really thought that he was in a Ku Klux Klan, and he had a different plan. It was a whole new approach. Frankly, I wasn't buying it. But what happened was that as God began to cause us to have to work together, I began to realize that this man loves God. I began to see God in this fellow. And so one particular day at work, we're working in, in the warehouse, and he begins to share with me the word of God. And it was myself, it was this Christian man, and another friend of mine who was also unsaved. And so what happened was that he would begin to say, well, God talks to me. <laughs> and my unsaved friend would say to him, well, God talks to you. You say, well, how do you know it's God? He said, because I know God's voice. And he went on to say that God's sheep know his voice and another voice they would not follow. So I began to say, hmm. But my friend was like, well, how you know it's God and it ain't yourself? And how you know it ain't the devil, you know, speaking to you, influencing you? And this Christian man would continue to share the word of God with us. My friend was trying to trap him. Me, myself, I took that information and said to myself, I have to store that away. Because I always knew that I should have been serving God. I always knew that. Even though I was rebellious, didn't want to have anything to do with God because I didn't want to have to give up anything in life. But yet still I knew I should have been serving God. So we worked together a whole week. And this, that Friday, this Christian man had to work somewhere else. And my friend and I, are standing there and we're talking and we're sharing with each other and we're looking over our lives and as we're walking across the warehouse I stopped and I told my friend I said man you know what I'm going to be a minister and I'm going to pastor a church and my friend he stopped he looked at me he said you think so and I'm like yeah I, I think so but at the time, I had no idea where that came from. God didn't speak to me. He didn't tell me that. But it was more or less like he dropped it in my spirit that I was going to be a minister and that I was going to pastor a church. And my friend said, you think so? And I said, yeah, I do. And then I asked him, I said, well, if that ever happens, would you come to my church? And he looked at me, he said, yeah. He said, I'll come. And I asked him, why would you come? He says, because I would want to come and see if it's true. I want to come and see if it's real. Because the devil has the ability to fool and deceive us. And at that point, my feelings were kind of hurt because here this man and I grew up together and my thoughts were, man, how could he think that I could be fooled? How could he think that I could be deceived? So my feelings were kind of hurt because I expected him to come because I was a minister, because I would be pastoring, and that he would simply want to set up under me. 
So I was disappointed with that. But then as I began to reflect back over it, I began to realize that, well, the devil had been deceiving me all of my life. Alcohol and partying and not wanting to give all these things up. But I began to realize that, yeah, he's got a point. He's got a point. Because the devil truly wants us to be deceived. He wants us to feel as though we can't quit drinking, quit smoking. He wants us to feel as though, man, party is what's going on, going to different clubs, you know. He wants us to get caught up in the activities of the world. Because everybody looks around, they say, well, that's the way the world is. That's, 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 our, that's life. Everybody goes through that. But the fact of the matter is, yeah, that is life. That is the way the world is. But the difference is that that's not the way God intended for it to be. Amen. So therefore, yeah, a lot of us have operated in deception. And so that was Friday. I came home from work that Friday, Saturday, and you have to realize that on Sunday, <laughs> I didn't go to church. I'm a diehard Lions fan, still am to this day. And when I stayed home on Sundays, more often than not, the Lions would lose. So there was no real joy, no real satisfaction there. And so after they'd lose, I'd go up to the corner store and I'd get me a 40 ounce and I'd come over and I'd drink. I'd go upstairs, turn my stereo on and shut the door. Another Lion lost. And it's really interesting because the word of the Lord says that we are not to have any other God except for God Almighty. And so I began to realize that, man, I treasured football, played it, coached it a little bit, point blank enjoyed it. And I still do, except for that now it's not a God to me anymore. And so what happened is that that Sunday morning, about 4.30 in the morning, the Spirit of God paid me a visit. And in Acts, the second chapter, the 17th verse, it talks about that in the last days that God would pour His Spirit out on all flesh. That your sons and daughters would prophesy and that old men would dream dreams and that young men would see visions. And about 4.30 that Sunday morning, the Spirit of the Lord pays me a visit. Here I am in bed, sound asleep, and I had this dream. And what I saw in the dream was Jesus Christ at the foot of my bed with his arms upon the rock, praying to heaven. And Jesus went from being Jesus to being my mother. And my mother reached back over her left shoulder and she reached for me. And as I was laying there, it was as though I was laying there in a casket flat on my back. But I reached out to her and her hands couldn't clasp. They couldn't come together. But as I reached out, I began to turn 180 degrees. And our hands came together. And when that happened, the power of God began to move through my body. It started in the top of my head, like a fireball. And it began to move through my body. And I remember trying to move, but I couldn't. But the word peace was spoken to me. And I relaxed. And like this fireball moved completely through my body. And I saw two pure white hands on the hips of my mother. 
And as a fireball moved through me, and once that feeling, that, that, that sensation left, I was back in my original position as I was laying in the casket, and my mother walked up to me, and she had this smile on her face, gloriously happy. And she cut my faith in, face, and she said, Lori and Kim are downstairs. So I'm laying there, and I'm like, man, wow. And I wake up, and I'm like a little frightened and a little scared, and my wife is asleep, and, and, and I nudge her a little bit, and I'm like, Bridget, are you all right? You okay? And she says, yeah. She says, I'm all right. And I'm like, man, I'm hot. And I throw the blanket back off me, and, and she says, well, why are you hot? I said, well, I just had a dream. She says, well, what, what was it? Tell me. But I wouldn't tell her. So I lay there recapping what had happened. I said, Lori and Kim are downstairs. And I'm like, now hold it. Ain't nobody downstairs but my two boys. So I jumped out of bed and I hurried downstairs. And I go to both the rooms and I check on them. And they're doing fine. So I begin to come back upstairs. And I'm about halfway up the steps, and I begin to realize that my T-shirt and my pajamas are soaking wet. They're like wringing wet. I got to the bed, and I put my hand on the sheet. It was soaking wet while I was pressed up against my wife. It was soaking wet. And I told my wife, I'm like, man, this... Man, this, I had a dream. She said, well, what is it? So I began to tell her the dream. And as I did so, she would cup her face, and I'd ask her, I'd say, well, what's the matter? And she says, oh, nothing. She says, it's just that everything I've been praying for is coming true. And so at this point, I want to take the liberty to say that for you wives that know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you wives that are living in accordance to the principles of the Word of God that have unsaved husbands be encouraged to continue to pray. Because 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says that we walk by faith and not by sight. And so even though it may look like this unsaved husband isn't coming around where God would desire him to be, I want to encourage you to keep praying because God answers prayer. And I can truly say, if it hadn't first of all been for Jesus praying for me, and then my mother who has been praying for me, and my wife who has been praying for me, chances are without, with, with not having them pray, I would still be unsaved and still caught up in the world or, or perhaps even dead. And so I thank God for my wife and my mother and even more importantly, Jesus Christ, for praying and being concerned about me personally. And it's really interesting because Jesus clearly has a personal stake in each and every one of our lives. The Bible says that he died on the cross for all the sins of the world. That's yours and that's mine. And so... This is Sunday morning. My wife and my children went to church. It was family day after church. Here God has came and paid me a visit. And yet and still she says, honey, it's family day after church. Are you going to church? And I said, no, I ain't going. And yet I knew I should have. I did not dismiss the things that had happened to me. I truly believed that it was God even though I didn't understand it. But it wasn't enough.
to make me go to church with my family. I stayed at home. I went up to the corner store after 12 o'clock, bought me a 40 ounce of Budweiser, came back home, sat down in front of the television and watched the Daytona 500. After that went off, my wife and them came home from church. I went back up to the corner store, went over to a cousin's of mine house. I sat there with them. I drank more beer. They were looking at a basketball game. I began to watch the game. But as I'm drinking and watching the game and I'm sitting there with them, I began to see that at that moment I was already set apart. Even though I was there in the midst of everything that was going on, I was not yet still a part of it, even though I anticipated it. And so what happened was that I felt out of place, like I really didn't belong. And so I left, I came home, I sat down on the couch, I told my wife what happened, and I was like, man, something's going on. And so it was Monday morning, I got up, I went to work, I told that Christian friend of mine, who I spent all last week with me, I told him what happened. He looked at me, he says, Barry, he said, that's just the power of God that moved through you. And what you need to do is you need to pray. You need to ask God what it all meant. And so he left out of my office. I sat there. I began to pray as I knew how. And not really expecting anything to happen, but I just prayed because that was the advice that he gave me. So I took his advice, and when I finished praying, I went out to work, and as I began to work, God began to witness to me. Well, Barry, when that fireball moved through you, what that was is that that was me purging you, preparing you. That was my way of cleaning you out. And I began to say, okay, all right, God. The two white hands that I seen on my mother, I'm like, well, God, what are they for? Because there's some healing that's going to even be coming into her life. I say, well, God, you said that Lori and Kim are downstairs. Those are my two baby sisters. He says, yes, I have a concern for them, but I also have a concern for your two children as well. I said, okay, God. So I came home from work that night. I called my mother. I told her, I said, Mom, you're going to be healed because my mother was very ill at that time. We're talking about February the 18th, which was Sunday morning, February the 19th, which is this Monday evening of 1990, that I'm calling my mother and I'm telling her, Mom, you're going to be healed because my mother was sick having chest pains, back and forth to the doctor, the doctor diagnosing it as muscle spasms in the chest. But we come to realize later on that she was having anginas and that she would eventually have a heart attack and eventually need open heart surgery. So I called her. I said, Mom, you're going to be healed. And she said, well, what are you talking about? So I began to share with her what had transpired 4.30 Sunday morning. And she says, baby, she said, listen to me. She says, number one, God is nobody to play with. And she says, if you're serious about seeking this out, then this is what you need to do. But if you're not, then you leave it alone. And so my mother said to me, Barry, go home and read the 10th chapter of Romans and so I did I read the 10th chapter of Romans it deals with salvation and I don't know exactly how much I read but I can tell you that I started reading about 9 o'clock Monday night 
And as I began to read that, I began to feel deeply sorry for the things that I had done in my life. I had heard so often that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he was crucified on the cross for all the sins of the world, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but should have everlasting life. I knew that. I'd read that so many times. But now it began to take on a whole new meaning. Jesus Christ died on the cross for all the sins of the world. <laughs> that was my sin. The drinking, the lying, the different women, the stealing, the cheating. And I began to feel sorry. Tears began to roll down my eyes because I truly, for the first time in my life, realized that Jesus Christ loved me. And I took that very personal. And I began to cry. I continued to read and I began to cry even more. And I continued to read and I began to cry even more. And here's a man that never went to church. But that night, I got down on my knees and stretched my hands to heaven. He said, Lord God, I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for the way in which I have lived. I'm a sinner. And I ask God to forgive me. I ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my heart and to show me how to live. And at that moment of crying out, in total sincerity and asking Jesus Christ to forgive me and come into my life, that's exactly what he did. And it was like the power of the Holy Spirit, zoom, penetrating me. And as Brother Norm mentioned earlier about the angels rejoicing in the presence of God when one truly repents, well, I can truly stand here and say that that is so. Because at that moment, I saw thousands and thousands of angels before God flapping their wings and chirping and rejoicing. I gloriously got saved right at home. Gloriously got saved right at home. So for those of you that have been told that you have to go to church to be saved, that's not true. But church is a place where we ought to be at because we need to hear the word of God. But that ain't where you have to get saved at. You can get saved wherever you desire to sincerely repent and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and come into your heart. Doesn't make any difference where that's at. And I thank God for that. For watching over my life all of those years when I thought I had it going on. I thank God for that. So here it is about 9.30 Monday night. I get up off of my knees. I go to bed. It's really interesting to see how God works because he had allowed my children to be in a bed. My wife was going upstairs to bed. And here I had this time alone with him and his word. And God was able to work. It's interesting how God will allow the devil to come into our lives to devour us, to eat us all up. But in the end, if we repent, he's always there to lift us up. And so that night I went to bed. I got up the next morning. And you need to understand that when it comes to going to work, I'm one of those guys that always wait till the last minute. I drive 33 miles of work. I got it down packed. Leave my house at 10 after 6 every day. Get to work 5 minutes to 7. Bam, I'm on, I'm on the job. Had it down pat. But this Tuesday morning, I'm coming down the steps, and the Spirit of God spoke to me. He says, Barry, read your Bible before you go to work. I'm like, man. 
I know I leave at the last minute. <laughs> I ain't got time to read my Bible. But what happened was that here, I'm taking a shower. I step out of the shower. The Spirit of God says, Barry, read your Bible before you go to work. Now I'm like, okay, Lord, what do I read? He says, 2 Timothy. So as I reach for the lamp to turn it on, I begin to glance at the clock. And Lord and behold, it's 20 minutes <laughs> before I have to leave to go to work. So I sat there, I began to read 2 Timothy, and I began my relationship with God. And as I be read 2 Timothy, God began to speak to me. I had a writer, a man by the name of Fred, who was also unsaved, who was going through a divorce, who knew very little about God. And at that very moment, God began to challenge me. He says, Barry, I want you to tell Fred that I love him. I want you to tell Fred that I see his situation. And I want you to tell Fred that he'll never get it all together without me. And so I'm like, I'm excited, you know, because here it is. I got this relationship with God, and I know this is God. Because believe me, ain't no, the devil is not going to tell you to read the Bible. <laughs> the devil is not going to tell you, well, tell brother so-and-so that I love him. The devil ain't going to tell you that. And on top of that, I felt like I never felt before. My vision was clear. Where I walked around in sin and darkness before, now I could see through Jesus Christ. I really began to realize how God intended life to be lived. But I was so busy after the American dream, if you will. And all the word of God says is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things I'll add on to you. But I'm like so many others. I wanted to do it the other way first and then get God last. But the fact of the matter is, that's not God's way. And so I began to tell Fred that how I had accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, began to share with him the events that led up to that. And I began to tell him that, Fred, God loves you and that he sees the situation that you're in. And God wants you to understand, Fred, that you'll never get it together without him. Fred says, I know it, man. The Lord says, ask him, does he pray? I said, Fred, do you pray? He said, it's been a while, man. It's been a while. Fred, I want you to understand that God truly desires to work magnificently in your life, that he personally cares for you, that he personally loves you. And to make a long story short, as it relates to Fred's life, he ended up going through a divorce. He got another woman. He's lost two children. He's still unsaved. Still trying to get his stuff together. But Fred doesn't realize that he's not going to get it together on his own. Because we can't do it on our own. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, I ain't a bad person. You know, I don't drink. I don't smoke dope. I don't cheat on my wife. I pay my taxes. I do all of these things. I'm not a bad person. Fine. So you're not a bad person. But if you expect to have life and to have it more abundantly, it's going to come through Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
a lot of people say, well, man, you know, nah, I don't go to church. You ain't got to go to church. No, nah, you don't. I got saved at home. But once you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're commanded to go to church, to assemble ourselves together, to fellowship with one another. Because one of the main things that I've learned as being a Christian is that you cannot be a Christian alone. Amen. You need support. Amen. You need help. <laughs> because if you desire to live in accordance with the word of God, you're going to get bombarded by the enemy. Amen. And if you aren't being bombarded, then it's fair to say that you're not doing very much for God. Yeah. And that's the truth. That's the truth. And a lot of people think that once you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, that you're all right. I'm going to heaven. And a lot of people truly believe that that's all it takes. But that's not all it takes. The Bible describes this thing as being a spiritual war. It goes on to say that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits, against principalities, against the rulers of darkness in heavenly places. This thing is truly spiritual. It's truly spiritual. It is a battle. And as a Christian, Yes, we have to go to church. We have to assemble ourselves together. We have to meditate on the word of God. We have to study the word of God. We have to spend time in prayer. And sometimes we have to deny ourselves with fasting. All these things are necessary to be able to war and to war effectively. Because surely, as there is a God in heaven, there is an adversary that desires to do nothing more than to destroy the people of God. And the people of God are being destroyed simply because of lack of knowledge. I had really no idea prior to getting saved that I could have a personal relationship with God Almighty through Jesus Christ. I had no knowledge of that. I didn't want to go to church because the few churches that I did go to, I would see the, pe the preacher Saturday night over so-and-so house. I'm saying to myself, now what I have to go to church for when the man of God supposedly ain't living right himself? I want nothing to do with that. My attitude was I can get to hell on my own. I was doing a good job of it. So I wasn't going to go listen to some preacher to tell me about how I need Jesus Christ. And he ran there with Sister Sally. Because that happened. And it's still happening right now. Sad to say. So no, I wouldn't encourage you to go to church. I didn't know nothing about walk by faith and not by sight. And there's a lot of sinners out there that don't understand that either. And rightfully so. You can't talk about faith. You can't walk in faith when you know nothing about Jesus Christ and where your faith ought to be. So I can understand why there's still a lot of sinners out there. But it is our responsibility as Christians to live a life to where the light of Jesus Christ shines. And in all of that world out there of sin and darkness, we have to be a beacon. A light that would draw them. But I come to realize this. We've all been commissioned to share the word of God. To counsel. To give godly wisdom. To share our knowledge and intellect with them that, that are hurting. Them that are struggling. Christians and sinners alike. We're instructed to do so. But even more importantly, I come to realize that no man, no woman or child can come to God unless God draw them. By his spirit, 
draw them. And I could truly say that God drew me to him. And once I quit being rebellious, once I looked around and got fed up with how my life was going and the circumstances in my life, once I got fed up with that and realized that there had to be a better way, then God decided, now I can use this man. And so, yes, I can truly say that I am born again, that the things that I used to do in the world that was so much fun and I got so much enjoyment and pleasure out of, I no longer do. And no, I don't miss them. And that's one of the deceiving aspects of all of this is that you literally don't have to give anything up. You don't have to give up drinking. You don't have to give up smoking. You don't have to give up chasing women. Because once you truly repent and come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he takes those things from you. So you don't have to give them up because God will take that desire away. And that's a blessing. Because when God takes them away, you don't miss them. But the devil will want to come back and tempt you with those things. And that's why you have to pray and that's why you have to meditate. That's why you have to assemble yourself together so that you can build up your most holy faith. Because, desire, because God desires for us to live life and that we might live life more abundantly. And I began to realize that, man, we can do all things with Christ Jesus who strengthens us. Our faith lies in Christ. Not in what we see, but it lies in Christ. And a lot of people have a problem with that. Because if they can't reach out and touch it, then they have no faith in it. But God desires us to seek him, to try him, to test him, to prove him and see if he will not perform his word. And he will. And he does. Christ is the key. Many times God came to my life. There was a time when I was in a service. There was a time when I was even sitting there before the guidance counselor. There was a time when God used a man at work to share that there was a call on my life. There was a time when I was working with my Christian friend and he just began to share his experiences of God. And there was even one time when I used to have a pastor friend and had a supernatural experience and I told him about it, he says, God has got something that he wants you to do. He says, I don't know what it is, but it's something that he wants you to do. And so the fact of the matter is that God throughout each and every one of our lives tries to get our attention. But a lot of times we're so caught up in our lives so caught up in the moment that we dismiss it as being so insignificant. But when I look back over my life, I'm saying to myself, man, what would have happened if I'd have told the guidance counselor that the number one job for me would be called to preach the gospel? Would he have directed me to seminary? Bishop Bible College in Dallas, Texas. Raymond Bible College in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I can't say because I don't know. I thought it, but I never said it. The pastor friend of mine says, Barry, God has got something he wants you to do. I don't know what that is. But what if I'd have got that godly counsel in that wisdom, in that godly guidance in that moment. What might have happened? 
I guess the point I'm trying to make is this. If God has got a plan, if he's got a purpose, if there's a call upon your life, you're going to perform that call before you leave this earth. And you can run from it. You can be rebellious. You can tell yourself, I don't need this God. But the fact of the matter is, if it's a call, it'll happen before you leave this earth. No, I never thought I'd be a minister. Never did. But the fact of the matter is, I'm studying for it right now. Going through leadership training right now. And I thank God for that. Because there is no greater joy than having a, reper than having a personal relationship with God. There's no greater joy than that. To where you can go into prayer over a problem, a situation, you need some direction, and you can go, get into prayer with God, spend time in prayer with God, and listen, and receive, and answer. Because it comes a time in each and every one of our lives when we have to know that we know we know God. You have to know it for yourself. It's personal. Jesus died on that cross personally for your sins and mine. It's personal. And God desires to have a personal relationship with you. I don't know what your perception is of God. Some people look at him as being, well, yeah, I believe there is a God. There's a superior being. There's a higher power. <laughs> yeah, there is a superior being. There is a higher power. Or there's a theistic atheist that says, well, yeah, I believe there's a God, but I believe that he made the atom and two atoms come together and bam, they exploded and here we got earth and we got green and yep, I believe that God came from, you know, excuse me, that man came from a monkey, you know, from generation to generation. I've had some of the most intellectual men tell me that, well, it's understandable that you would believe in creation because... You don't have a higher education, therefore you can't begin to understand Darwin's theory of evolution. <laughs> yeah, I've been told that. <laughs> I just kind of looked at him and said, well, God bless you, <laughs> and I'm praying for you. <laughs> because I believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God. How do I know that? Because after I got saved, I began to read, I began to study, and I began to apply the word of God to my life. And that is what enables me to say that I know, that I know, I know. And no one can change my mind on this. No one can turn me around on this. Because I truly know that God loves me. My mother went through open heart surgery. God delivered her through that thing, and in that whole process, it took nothing but faith. Doctors perform open-heart surgery every day. They do it in a very routinely manner, but it ain't nothing that we go through every day. And it takes some faith. And as I began to walk up and down the corridor in that hospital, people would begin to ask me, are you a minister? Are you a pastor? I'm like, well, no, I've just accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I would begin to share with people what God had done in my life. They could sense the presence of God on me. Some people were encouraged. Others would run from the presence of God. But it's not anything that I did on my own. But it was by God's grace that I would say because I could have been dead. So many times I could have been dead. But it was God's grace that kept me. 
is God's hand that guided me and directed me. It is the favor of God that was upon my life that allows me to stand where I'm at right now. And people look out and they look in the world and they see all of the problems, all of the situations, the wars and rumors of wars. And if God loves everybody, how can he cause a tidal wave to wipe out so many people? If God loves everybody, how come earthquakes happen? Innocent people dying. But as you begin to look at your personal life, And as you begin to reflect over the things that are happening in your personal life, you can begin to understand why a lot of these things happen. Because when I look back over my personal life, I didn't have time for God. I didn't want to make time for God. I thought I was doing all right. My family were all healthy. You have time for God. But I began to realize that when God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and he add all, all these other things unto you, I began to realize this. That number one, God simply desires for men and women to worship him. All God desires is for us to turn from our wicked ways and to acknowledge him. If you begin to look back over the Old Testament, you can begin to see time and time again how the children of Israel got in trouble. They cry out to God. God would come to the rescue. They'd go along fine worshiping God and then sooner or later they'd fall in idolatry again. They would begin to replace God with something else, some other God, some other idol. Then they'd get in trouble. They'd cry out to God and God would come to them again. A whole nation. And after you look over the nations of this earth, you come to realize this. That all God is saying is turn from your wicked ways. If man would every now and then look over their shoulder and say, God, help me. Help me. Then God would hear from heaven. And as individuals begin to turn, the nations would begin to turn. And God will begin to deliver his people personally. Families being delivered. And then nations would eventually be delivered. But like me and so many others, we had time for it. We had no faith, we had no confidence in, in this God, this superior being. But he is real. And if you haven't got time, I encourage you to make time. If you're not going to church, begin to go. If you're lost and don't know where to start, ask him. Trust him. Believe in him. And I guarantee that your life will begin to change. No man can come to God except God draw him. What we have to fail to realize is that when that moment of visitation comes, we have to grasp it and we have to go with it. February the 18th of 1990, 4.30 in the morning, God came to me as real as I'm standing here. And I took that moment to realize that this is real. I didn't understand it all, but I trusted it. I put my faith in it. And now I sincerely understand it. 
that God simply desires to show himself to us. Not as he is portrayed in the world, but as he is portrayed in his word. That's how God desires to reveal himself to us. God is not a respecter of persons. That is to say that God doesn't love Moses more than he loved me or the apostle Paul more than he loved me or that he loves me more than he loves you. That's not the case. He has a genuine, equal love for each and every one of us. It's just that we have to learn to trust him. We have to learn to place our faith in the works that Jesus Christ did on the cross. And for a lot of intellectuals, they say that's, that's, that's just, that's unheard of. I just, I just, I just can't fathom that. <laughs> I just, no, I, no, no, I, no, that, that, there's, that just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> That's right. It probably doesn't. And the Bible goes on to say that man is confounded by the wisdom of God. We'll never understand God totally. And God isn't in some far off third heaven someplace and, and, and so deep in his word to where the simplest of minds <laughs> can't grasp it. The Bible clearly says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It says simply believe. Believe in the works that Jesus Christ did on the cross and you can be saved. Our faith lies in that. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that when we die in the flesh, that our soul might spend eternity with God Almighty. The price has already been paid. This, the bloodshed of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we would just simply believe, so that we might receive the gift of God, which is salvation. He gave it freely. So no man can say, well, look what I did. <laughs> no, he gave it freely. And there's no other way that we can get through God except through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the vine. God is the vine dresser. We are the branches. If we would just simply believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, born of a virgin birth, crucified on the cross, was buried and was resurrected, and now is in heaven sitting at the right hand of the Father. If you believe those things, then you're going to hell. If you do not believe those things, then I pity you and I feel sorry for you. Don't let the devil tell you that, well, once you're dead and gone, that's over with. <laughs> no, that's, that's not the case. Your spirit goes back to God and your soul either goes to heaven or it goes to hell. Don't let people tell you that, well, we live in hell right now. We're living in hell right now. No, you ain't living in hell right now. You're living in the devil's kingdom. Ain't no question about that. You know, this is his domain. And if Adam and Eve hadn't never sinned, he wouldn't have this. But this ain't hell. This is not hell. You need to understand it. You need to know that. That the spirit of God is active and working in this earth through his people. Jesus said that you would do greater works than what he did. That signs and wonders would follow. 
And the Spirit of God is working in this earth through his people and miracles are being performed. And yet and still there are them that say, I don't believe. I just don't believe that. You need to understand that when God said that he would pour his spirit out on all flesh, that's exactly what he meant. Personally, I'm glad that God so loved the world that he gave Jesus Christ. There's no greater gift than salvation. God desires to be a part in each and every one of our lives. But we have to ask. We have to believe in order to receive. And if we do that, God is faithful enough to meet us in that moment. And I thank you for that. I thank you for my mother and my wife who continue to lift me up in prayer. Unsaved, I surely was. Thought I had it going on? Sure did. <laughs> but what's taking place in my life now can't match what I thought I was doing. Hearing from God, experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, there's no greater reward than that. To be able to stand up and say that I'm a child of the Most High God is a blessing. Because I could have been dead and gone. It is a blessing to know what God has allowed me to be born into this earth for. I know that my purpose for living was to be a minister, to pastor, and to preach and to share and to teach the word of God. With signs and wonders following. I believe that. I've experienced that. In my faith lies in God that it would come to pass. But one of the most disappointing things. Is that here men and women have been born. With able minds and bodies able to do great works for God and they never realize what they've been placed in the earth for. Oh, they realize that they have to work, they're raising families, but they aren't taking any time off for God. And it's a shame that the graveyard is some of the most richest soil in this land because there have been so many men and women that have died and left this earth with talents on the inside of them with the ability on the inside of them to serve God. God gives gifts to men and women alike. And so many have died and left this earth without the opportunity to be used by God. So that gift, that talent that was intended to be used died with them. I do not want to be one to be able to stand before God and God says, well, what did you do for me? Because there's going to come a time when we're all going to be judged. We're going to stand before the throne of God. The book of life is going to be open. If your name isn't found in it, you're in trouble. The book of deeds is going to be open. And if you've done nothing for Christ, what an embarrassing moment that would be. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ comes back, that the dead in Christ will rise first. And for those of us that are alive, we'll get caught up with them. And back to heaven, we're going to go. The Christians are going to be judged. You're going to be asked, what have you done for Christ? 
I pray that for those that are listening, that you don't spend your whole life caught up in the things of the world and never experience the salvation that God has freely given. Because you will be judged. You will be asked, what have you done for Christ? So I thank you for this time, for this opportunity to share And I pray that if you're not going to church, that you will begin to go. For your wives that have unsaved husbands, continue to pray, continue to be encouraged because God hears your prayers. He answers prayer. And he will continue to watch over, to guide, and direct. Perhaps there's some husbands with unsaved wives. All I can tell you is keep praying. Keep believing God for them. Keep encouraging them. Don't get all upset, angry, fly off at the handle. But continue to operate in love and operate in the spirit and in the word of God. Because God does perform miracles. From the simplest ones to some of the greater ones. A miracle is still a miracle. Amen. Amen. This is my wife of 13 years, Bridget. I'm very uh, pleased to be able to introduce you to her. This is the woman that, through all of my changes and through all of my unbelief and rebellious time, this is the woman that stood by me, that prayed for me, and I thank God for it. She has a few things that she wants to share. Amen. Evidence of things to come. As you see, my husband is evidence of things to come. I just want to encourage some of you wives out there that are saved and your husbands are unsaved. We know in Corinthians, or if you don't know, in Corinthians chapter, first, seventh chapter of Corinthians, first Corinthians, it says, it talks about husbands and wives and how the wife, you have an unsaved husband, how the wife sanctifies the husband. So wives, be encouraged. Live the life that God has called you to live. You know, even though that husband, sometime I know you may feel like you wanna kill him, you know, you know, it, it get discouraging sometimes. You know, I shed a lot of tears. I know a lot of, had a lot of hurts and a lot of pain, but you be encouraged. You stay before God and pray and put that man before the Lord and still continue to do as God has commissioned you to do. Live that life before him. Continue to read your word. Continue to pray. Continue to cook meals. Continue to clean, do the laundry, you know, because sometimes we have a tendency, oh, he's not doing what, what he's supposed to do, and we want to not do those things. But continue to be that example, because through him watching you, that will cause him to draw him to Christ. As, as my husband was saying, that we are like a beacon. Wives, you could be a beacon unto your husbands. You know, living the kind of life, even with your children, before your children's. You know, we know that the husband is called to be the priest of the home. And we know sometimes the husband may come in and he's not, you know, he sets the whole atmosphere of how the home is going to be on that day. You know, sometimes he may come home, he had a bad, terrible time on the job or whatever. But it's still, it's up to you as a wife to still continue to love him you know, and encourage him, you know, hug him, go to him and say, honey, you know, did you have a good day today? Or if he didn't have a good day, you know, and sometimes husbands make it hard for you. You know, they may want to put a wall up, but get some good around, some good saved friends. I mean, some ones that's truly saved, that's going to help pray. I mean, really pray through like the old folks say, pray through. You really have to be encouraged and pray through and believe God. That's the main thing. You have to have faith and believe. Like I said, my husband is evidence of things to come. So whenever things get bad, you know, think about this tape. Those who are watching this tape, think about my husband. My husband, it took 10 years of praying. And I know some of you saying, well, I don't have that long. But I tell you, just hang in there. Be encouraged. 
Just be encouraged. And I, and I bet you, I guarantee you that God will begin to do a work in that husband. Begin to look at your husband like, as God looks at you. Don't look at them through the eyes, because the enemy will come in and try to put all kinds of thoughts and things into your mind and into your head. But just love that husband. If you honestly believe that your husband is worth you fighting for and praying for, you know that it's a call upon that man's life, or you know everyone has a destiny. You pray and you pray and you pray and stay before God and continue on staying before God and, to, and continue to hear from God and walk in those things, but yet still submit yourself to your husband. And I know it's not easy to submit when they're not doing what they're supposed to, but you be encouraged and you continue to stay before God and get around, like I said, some saved friends and talk with your pastor and his wife. They will truly help you. Our pastor's been there for us. And I encourage you to get with your pastor, get with someone that you can really trust and begin to open up and begin to talk and to share those things that are going on. Someone that you can really, really trust. And ask, if you're not sure, ask God who you should go to. He'll tell you who to go to. Amen. I just want you to be encouraged. God bless you. Bridget, we forgot to get your name. He said, this is my lovely wife or my wife, but we didn't get your name. People may want to put a name with who you were before we let you go. It's Bridget Pierce. Amen. Uh, your husband, Barry, has been speaking. And we were just talking about a couple of things with the camera off, and I just wanted you to come back and impart that. I think it's important what you were just sharing that you impart that uh, to the TV viewers. Would you do that for the gals? Because there's some additional wisdom that God wants to, to impart to Sure. to somebody out there sure sure um yes um i just wanted to share with you yes i mean now that my husband is saved you know i don't want to leave you with the preconceived notion that everything is like a bed of roses you know but even when they're saved you still have problems because you know we know that the enemy he comes to steal and kill and to destroy so even in that so i don't want to leave you with the preconce preconceived notion that everything is going to be fine but i still want you to know that it makes a difference when you both are equally yoked you know, you begin to share together. You've been, everything just changes. Your prayer life begins to change. You, the way you hear from God, it begins to change when you both are equally yoked. Your marriage change. Your sex life changes. Everything just changes when the, both of you are equally yoked. God bless you. And that's all you had. That's all okay, I had. Okay, thanks Amen. a lot, Bridget. God bless you. Well, these folks are from Muskegon, and we just appreciate them coming down to be used of God. I'll tell you, there has just been a truckload full of wisdom and insight imparted to you, and I hope that um, you can take much of this wisdom and insight and use that because it's all right on. You know, Brother Barry just shared some incredible, credible things that I wish I had 10 hours to go nonstop just commenting on some of the things that he shared. Um, one of the things that he said that is so vitally important, um, so many people have the feeling that once they have come uh, to the salvation knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been saved. I've given my life to Jesus. Um, now I'm going to get to heaven, which means I get all of the rewards that everybody else gets. And that's not true. That is not Bible. Uh, Christians will not be rewarded uh, for salvation. Yeah, you get to heaven, and that in and of itself is the only reward we need. But... The Bible mentions uh, very clearly in, in where it's spoken about that our rewards will be um, determined to a great deal on what we do for God once we become saved. And so I just want you to not take lightly what Brother Barry shared. See, God ordained that human beings would work in cooperation with his plan to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. 
See, God doesn't need one human being to get his job done. He can take one angel and fly one angel around planet Earth like the space shuttle, yelling, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He doesn't need a human to do that. Take one angel, broadcast that 24 hours a day until it's absolutely like chalk across the blackboard for those who don't want to hear that one more time. God could do that. I mean, he's got innumerable ways that he could share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet he didn't ordain it to happen that way. He ordained it for people like Brother Barry to turn his life over to Jesus Christ, begin to get into the Bible or God's Word, ask the Holy Spirit to help you to understand it, which he delights in doing, and as soon as we begin to feast on this spiritual manna, this spiritual bread here, the bread of life, then we begin to see that God wants to use us to impart what he gives us to others. That's how God uses people. And our rewards will be to a high degree, I don't have a full revelation of all of the rewards situation, but I know to some degree, we will not all have the same rewards in heaven. I mean, if God truly has a call for my life, and I disobey that call, even though I may be saved, and according to the word of God, you will. Well, I'll tell you, I remember a story one time that just broke my heart. Um, I went to an accountant. He was doing my taxes. And um, this guy, uh, when he came to the door, he had to do it on um, some, some, some artificial help. He had no feet. Uh, his uh, feet had been cut off at the ankles, and all he had was stubs, and it was tough for him to get around. And I felt very sorry for this guy. He, he uh, obviously put him out of uh, commission to be able to do a lot of things. And... <clears throat> Uh, in our uh, dealings with uh, figures, uh, he began to um, he began to ask some spiritual questions about my situation, and I, I opened up, shared some things about my beliefs with God, and and I'll never forget when he said to me, Norm, he says, if God has a call on your life, never refuse that call. Well. <sighs> Hey, I don't think anybody really would take something of that nature lightly. But I thought, now why would he be telling me that? I mean, why? And he says, look at my feet, Norm. <laughs> look at my legs. He didn't have any feet. He says, do you know why I don't have two feet to this day? I don't know. He says, I can't prove this, but I believe the reason I don't have two feet is because God allowed these two feet to be taken off me. He says, I was not born this way. It was an accident. But he said, God called me to be a pastor years ago, and I told God I was not going to be a pastor. I told God I was an accountant. I am not a pastor. And I and so the day came when I lost two feet. And so um, uh, he says, I believe that I disobeyed God's call. I believe I'm going to get to heaven. I believe I'm going to be saved. But he says, I believe that this was God's attention getter for me in that. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not. I don't know if he got a revelation from God. But I thought, whoa, how could you prove that this was not God? So Brother Barry just hit such an important truth. God has a job for every one of us to do for him. It may be small in our eyes or it may be huge, but God has a plan. And I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to think about those words. What is God's plan for your life? after you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, what does he have for you to do for him? If you know that you know that you know when you stand before God, and you don't want to wait until you stand before God, you can know in this lifetime. You can know this God wants you to know now, not after you die. And so I want to encourage you to seek God in what 
he would have you do for him. And don't put any conditions on it. Go anywhere, do anything, because your reward will be maximized in heaven for doing so. Well, man, there's a, there's a scripture that keeps coming to mind, and for someone, I just have to believe the Holy Spirit wants somebody to hear this. In the book of Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it reads, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So much could be said about that particular sentence, but here's what I sense God saying. He is a rewarder of those who seek him. I want to encourage you to seek God. I want to encourage you to seek Jesus Christ. Why Jesus Christ? See, that's another thing that Barry mentioned that is very important. I want to challenge you with just a few remaining minutes that's left about what the Word of God has to say about this one called Jesus Christ. See, Scripture says that Jesus Christ was not only the Son of God, meaning His Father was the Holy Spirit united with the egg of Mary. That's why He became the Son of God. He was not fathered by a human father. He was fathered by the Holy Spirit, as Scripture records. That made Him the Son of God. But He's also God the Son, meaning what? The Bible says He was all of God all of God. He had the fullness of deity in him uh, before he came down into the, to the form of a mere man. The Son of God always was and always will be. He was before he came down into the form of a man. He never was not, in other words. Okay, quickly, let me just read for you. Um, oh, there's so many fantastic scriptures on who Jesus Christ um, really was and is, okay? And uh, let's just quickly go to the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. Listen carefully. For by Jesus, for by Him, all things were created. That's what the Bible says. You look it up. New Testament Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Some other exciting things that, as you would read on down there. Let's go to chapter 2 in the book of Colossians. Chapter 2, verse 9. Ooh, good stuff. For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In other words, if you're a Christian, you're saved, you're born again, you have been given the authority over every demonic being um, that the devil has. Um, Philippians chapter 2, another great verse about who Jesus Christ was before he came into the form of a mere man, walked this earth for 33 years before he died, rose, and resurrected out of that grave after three days. Chapter 2, Philippians, verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who... Being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Folks, turning your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ is turning your life over to the creator of the universe. For when you're connected to the Lord Jesus Christ the way God desires for you to be, then you're properly connected to God the Father as well as God the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Godhead. So I encourage you to ask yourself this question until you can confidently get an answer that you can stand before God and give an answer to Him. Either you're going to be right or you're going to be wrong. There's no gray area. Jesus Christ either is what the Bible says about Him or it's totally wrong. Okay? If it's wrong there, then the whole Bible is wrong. But if it's right, what are you going to do about it? It'll be too late after you die. I encourage you, make your decision to go on a journey to find out who this Jesus Christ is. And I want to tell you that sometimes God will not allow you to intellectually know who Jesus is until you're willing to experience him personally. That's why asking him to come into your life help you to change. See, God will prove himself to you when you desire to experience him. Okay? Well, I wish I had more time. I just want to thank you for letting me share that with you. You have been watching Saturday Night Testimonies Live. We've had Barry and Bridget Pierce sharing with us tonight. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you for taking the time to watch. I hope that somehow, some way, it has been encouraging, insightful, uh, that God has truly given you something that will stir your heart, that will confirm that you're on the right track, if in fact you are, will convict you if you're on the wrong track. God desires for you to be spiritually connected with Him. He desires that you bring Him glory in everything you think, say, and do. That's why God created every human being, to bring Him glory and to glorify Him in everything we think, say, and do. It's impossible to do that until we get connected to God and allow the power of the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the Word of God to help us begin to think, say, and do what is pleasing to Him. Okay? And um, we will offer a, a free audio cassette of this broadcast to those people that would be willing to write to us and let us know. What has this broadcast meant to you? Has it encouraged you? Has it blessed you in any way? If you'll take the time to write a brief letter and request a copy, we'll send you a free audio cassette copy of this broadcast if you would like one. If you don't want one, that's okay. Just send us a letter anyway. It's good to hear um, uh, from our viewers. We want to know. And if you have any prayer requests, please take the time to write those. Write down your situation so that we can know how to pray for you. We don't take those prayer requests lightly. We will be praying for you that God will reveal wisdom, deliverance, healing, insight into your situation. If you don't have anybody else that's willing to pray for you. Send us a letter. Let us know your prayer needs. We will pray for you. Also, uh, if you are a born-again Christian and you uh, would like to explore the possibility of being used of God to uh, uh, come and share your testimony on this outreach, by all means, please uh, take the time to write down uh, your testimony and send it to us. There's an address coming up shortly. So for those of you who uh, would like a free audio cassette copy of this, uh, broadcast or would like to send us a copy of your testimony, there's an address coming up, so get something to write with right now. I would encourage you to do so, so that when that comes up, you'll be ready. Also, we do want to say that 
Perhaps uh, you might be visiting from another locality, another city, and you just happen to turn this broadcast in and something has caught your interest and maybe you would like to see um, uh, testimonies of this nature playing in your community or your city. We do offer a free audio cassette as well explaining how you can set that up. A lot of people do not know about public access. Some people aren't even sure how to run a camcorder. So we want to be able to help um, God um, uh, take these testimonials out any way he would so that people like you can um, hear what God is doing in the lives of common, ordinary, everyday people. We don't get professional testifiers. We get people who are scared to death, who's nervous, have never spoken. Those are the ones we like because it keeps them honest and it keeps them truthful. And we, 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 don't, we don't deal with money here. This is, a, this is not a uh, ministry where we make appeal for funds. It's just simply uh, something that people can listen to and hear how Jesus Christ has brought about change in the lives of others. So encourage those of you to, uh, who would be interested in sharing your testimony, send us a copy. And uh, we'll... Uh, see how the Lord would lead in that situation. Also want to share that if you would be interested in coming out and hearing one of these broadcasts live, we invite the public to come in and hear the testimonies live. Uh, there's a phone number coming up and you would want to call that phone number uh, before Saturday evenings to find out where we would be uh, doing these broadcasts at the time that you might want to come because uh, there's no guarantee uh, the exact location that we'll be filming at. Currently we're at the Salvation Army in Grand Haven and we thank God for the location here but you might be seeing this three, five, ten years down the road and we might be um, on the west coast, east coast, there's no way of knowing. So call the phone number, there will be an answering machine there and it will tell you the location. We meet 7 p.m. on Saturday nights, so I um, encourage you to uh, uh, come out and uh, hear these live. We just want to thank God for the public access stations that are airing these broadcasts and we ask Christians to pray for their local public access station that God's blessings, his abundance of finances would come in so that they can continue to um, uh, play these broadcasts on public access channels. I want to say that the views and opinions expressed on this broadcast are solely those of Barry's, Bridget, and my own, and uh, not of any others. So at this time, uh, the mailing address, phone number, and the tape number, there's a tape number as well that you'll want to write down to identify this broadcast if you'd like a free audio cassette copy of it. So with that, God bless you. This is the, this is the address, phone number, and tape number you can take down if you'd like. Uh, you can send uh, your letters to uh, Precious Testimonies, P.O. Box 516, Jenison, Michigan, zip code 49429. Your letters are helping us take these uh, broadcasts out. We should present these letters that you send to the public access station so that they can monitor what these broadcasts are doing to the viewing public. The tape number, if you want a free audio cassette tape of this broadcast, is 215. Be sure to mention that. Call 616 457 Six five five seven. If you want to come to a live broadcast, that way you'll know the location on a given Saturday night. Till next time, this is Norm Rasmussen, your host and director of this outreach, wishing you God's best as you continue along life's journey. Precious Testimonies is a non-denominational ministry, and we do appreciate the prayers and support of those who are helping us make these broadcasts possible. On behalf of that, I want to wish you God's best one more time.